Welcome, lovely people. Today we are going to be doing our second episode of our Bhakti Wednesday series called Devotional Mysticism and Plant Teachers. And today's episode, we're going to focus on a very sacred plant that I think is such a beautiful one for really opening up this box of wisdom of plant knowledge. And so we're going to be talking about roses. Um, Today's talk is sponsored by or is hosted by Nightlight Astrology um, and also Sky House Herb School and Urban Davy. And so I am going to be speaking from my experience as an herbalist about the plants and also my, my morsels of experience in, in Bhakti Yoga. And Ruk Mini Walker is here with us today from Urban Davy. And um, she has such a beautiful depth of wisdom to speak about this from many different mystical traditions, including over 50 years of experience in bhakti yoga. So welcome, Rukmini. I'm so happy that you're back here today to speak with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. And, and I just want to point people back. If you guys haven't had a chance, um, sorry, my phone was there and I know it's going to, I know it's going to buzz. It always does that at the most inopportune time. So, um, but I wanted to point you all back to the very first episode that we did our introduction because I want you to be able to have a little bit of context for today's episode and also to hear a little bit more about Rukmini Walker's background, her contact information, you know, more ways to engage with her. So please do, you know, you don't have to stop right now, but please do listen back to that first talk because um, it'll give you some really rich resources and ways to think about today today's conversation. So let's open up maybe, Rukmini, could you start us off and open up this space of exploration with some prayers? I'd love to. Thank you. What an honor. I'll chant some prayers in uh, Sanskrit and some in English. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Yananjana salakaya Jaksun militam yena tas my shi gurave namaha. I offer my respects to my teachers who have opened my eyes. While I was standing in the darkness of ignorance, they've opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. Nama om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale. Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Koravani Pracharine Nirvishe Shasunyavadi Paschatadi Shatarine. And here's a prayer I love very much. I'll just share the English with you. This is from the Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavat Purana, spoken by the little voice saint, Prahlad Maharaj. It says, may the, I just feel this prayer is so pertinent right now in our world. May the entire universe be blessed with peace and good hope. May everyone driven by envy and enmity become pacified and reconciled. May all living beings develop abiding concern for the welfare of others. May our own hearts and minds be filled with purity and serenity. May all these blessings flow naturally from this one supreme benediction. May our attention become spontaneously absorbed in the rapture of love unto the transcendent Lord. Mm, yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I just find that opening these spaces with prayer and these sort of deep words of reflection and wisdom put us in the mindset to talk about these topics in a, in a deeper way. And, and to me, when I was listening to Prahlad's prayer, just um, calling back to the heart and to this um, spontaneous um, devotion that comes through, um, you know, that's very much the medicine of the rose. The rose is such a medicine of the heart and, you know, a cleanser of the heart, um, an inspirer of the heart. So maybe we can just, you know, begin with this and, and begin with 
um, reflections on the rose in a, in a larger way. And what are some of the ways that you speak or you think about the rose and why, you know, what, what is it, its mystical qualities that stand out to you? Thank you so much. Yeah, the rose is a very sacred flower in mystical poetry, and it represents the spiritual realm and the mysteries and the beauty of the um, spiritual path. And um, the red rose represents the red heart, right? Um, the red heart of the one on the spiritual path. And, and it represents the journey um, on the mystic path toward wholeness and the path toward becoming a complete human being. Mm -hmm. um, and one other point I wanna share is that our heart contains inside of it, the beauty and the purity that's so similar to the rose. And it's during life, just living, you know, during the course of living that that scent becomes revealed just as, as the rose gradually opens from a bud into a full blown flower, right? So just by living that gradually, that um, scent becomes revealed. It's originally in, you know, that beauty is originally invisible, but it, it's perceptible by those who can feel its presence. So yeah, those are some. some uh, I love that. And you know, it reminds me of the story you shared about um, something that Prabhupada, your teacher said to you very early on, which is, you are a beautiful girl, now become more beautiful inside. <laughs> and isn't that the rose, you know, it's like this bud, like he, and this is, you know, spiritual teachers, they see that bud. Um, mm. But your teacher so wisely was like, well, you know, from the inside, become more beautiful. Um, and then that's what allows that flowering, that opening, and then ultimately the giving of the pollen, the fragrance, the nectar, mm. all of those things. Mm, so beautiful. Yeah, you know, um, the seeker's heart um, acts like a rose and blooms like a rose. And, and, um, and when this kind of state of inner beauty is, is found and achieved, the, the, sa the fragrance can be sensed, right? Um, people come face to face with a, a a person on the spiritual path or a realized person and that and the fragrance of the of their heart like the fragrance of a rose becomes a guide um, that can bring people to the um, place of transcendence or to bring them to their own heart their own um, center and in the present moment and um, to the path of further progress you know i love that there's a beautiful um, poem uh, from the Islamic poet Rumi, where he says, and I love this so much, he says, forget your beard, everybody with a beard, forget your beard and self-importance, be an invisible guide, like the scent of roses that show where the inner garden is. Um, so I love that so much. And and, you know, so I really think that um, someone on the spiritual path in bhakti, we say the devotee, the bhakta, um, the devotee of the Lord is like a lover who is perfuming herself to attract her only beloved. But along the way, she begins to attract everyone who crosses her path. Mm -hmm. um, so by anointing ourselves with this perfume of love to attract only, only our Lord, along the way others become attracted as well oh wow yeah and as you were saying that and i was that image of the beard i don't know if you've ever come across roses that don't have a scent um you know unfortunately more and more you know they become so adulterated and they've been bred for just the external beauty mm. and just for their resilience but not for that that smell um which is part of their gift and part of how also how they um, they're so attractive to bees. And so, you know, on the spiritual path, this, I, I love this analogy too, because we can be, we can beautify the external, um, but there's no fragrance, you know, we can be, you know, it, the, that 
that true spiritual work is such an inside job. That's what mm -hmm. makes the sweetness and the fragrance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, like, well, like any kind of fruit or, or vegetable, you know, like tomatoes that are grown to be another something red, right? Mm -hmm. Grown to be so perfect in the marketplace, but then so, so often the taste is not there. So we're, you know, on the spiritual path, we're looking for the fragrance and we're looking for the deep taste. This is in bhakti, this is called rasa. The, the taste of relationship with divinity, the taste of relationship with the beloved. So, mm. so important. Yeah. Go within. Go within and yeah, and that's, and, and cultivate that nectar and that fragrance. And yeah, I love the image. There's, um, you probably know this one where this is from, but I think it's in the Bhagavatam, but it's um, when Radha is having the conversation with the bee <laughs> and um you know she's she's cursing krishna because you know he's gone and she's cursing the bee and tell krishna never to come back and you know <laughs> this this little bee is you know just you know um and then and then suddenly she's like no but wait no don't tell him to leave don't you know, please he can come back anytime and just you know but the bee would have never been there if the fragrance of the flowers wasn't there that conversation can't happen without that presence right without that right. spiritual presence and the fragrance of her love uh -huh. and sometimes it said some commentators say that that bee was actually krishna coming in the form of a bee because of the fragrance and the taste of her love beautiful so. <laughs> oh all attractive <laughs> oh so i think we should talk about bees in one of our future conversations oh that would be lovely mm -hmm beautiful images of bees. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm thinking too about um, a Persian myth that I, I came across when I was doing some research about, um, about roses and in Persian myth, myth, the, they place roses on the graves of those who pass because they believe that the rose is the only thing that can go with a person across the threshold to the, the, the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about how, how beautiful that is because there's so little we can actually take with us. You know, what, what all of these possessions, all of these material things we accumulate in our lives, but what is the only thing that actually travels with us when we pass? And, you know, the rose represents love and yeah. that the devotion. Fragrance. That the fragrance. fragrance of our love. Isn't that beautiful? The fragrance of our love goes with us, you know? Yeah, you can't take anything with you, but what can you take? You can take your love. Your love goes with you. Mm. The love that you've cultivated in your life carries you with you carries you to the next place even you know uh, whether that love whatever kind of love that whatever attachment we have carries us the, because it said that that the body trans transfers but the mind just transforms mm -hmm. so the mind like a fragrance carries us to the next um life whatever it may be and so someone on the spiritual path is looking for um an eternal life in the spiritual realm beyond beyond the you know circus or merry-go-round not so merry merry-go-round mm. <laughs> of, of repeated birth and death yeah 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 and i love the subtlety of the of the mind as it's seen in the yoga tradition you know it's it's um it's such a subtle thing, but it's such a powerful thing. So, you know, careful what we think, <laughs> you know, and what we're thinking about at the time of death, you know, what are we thinking about, you know, what holy names are crossing through the mind or um, what images or what feelings or what fragrances are passing through as we make that transition. And for me as a yoga teacher teaching asana for so many years, you know, Shavasana, I would say to my students, we practice Shavasana, it's corpse pose because we want to practice consciousness mm -hmm. at the moment of death. And so every time we come to Shavasana, corpse pose, notice what's on your mind. Mm -hmm. How can we refine it? Beautiful. And the fact is that, you know, whatever we uh, think of, whatever we meditate on, whatever we're attached to in this life will come before our eyes in our last moments, like a, like a film reel, whatever we're attached to. So that's why 
you know, bhakti or other spiritual, their cult of spiritual paths, their cultivation. It's not just, um, you know, it's it's a practice that it's like just like growing roses, right? We have to cultivate them. We have to turn over the soil. We have to use all of the natural um, protections to keep away um, infestation of unwanted um, bugs. So in our lives, we have unwanted bugs also, right? Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and rose is not, it's temperamental. It's not an easy plant to cultivate. It's It has very specific likes and dislikes. And here in Minnesota, we can only grow certain varieties. And there's a very particular way you have to tuck the heads, you have to tuck all the heads in, and then you have to create a little bed of straw around it to protect it through the winter. Um, but it stays green. You can actually keep your roses green all winter long, even up here in the far north by this method, this old ancient method of, of protecting them. And so, you know, we can do the same thing in our spiritual life life is mm. you know it's when things get when when the external conditions get really challenging mm, how do we bring ourselves back in and protect you know i was reading something about a man i forget his name but from france during world war ii his father and his grandfathers had all cultivated roses and in, in france and then when the world when the war came i believe it was world war one he began um sending he called it the peace rose and he began sending cuttings of his roses all over Europe as a message of peace to Germany and to everywhere. And so, yeah, it's a beautiful wow. thing. Yeah. Cultivation of the heart and cultivation of peace between external enemies, right? Yeah. 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 But the rose isn't all, you know, it's not, it is peace and beauty and love, but it also has thorns, you know? And I think that's such an interesting part of this plant. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, why, why do you think it has thorns? What is thorn? How do thorns relate to our spiritual lives? Mm, beautiful question. Very deep question. Well, again, to, to um, bow to the poet Rumi, um, you know, the, the wise person of the Middle East, he said that the rare, and I love this so much. He says that the rarest essence of the rose is in the thorn. Mm. Isn't that so inscrutable for us in a culture where, you know, we just want to enjoy ourselves and have a good time and forget everything, you know, but the rose is about, it represents wholeness. And during the spiritual journey toward, toward connection, toward oneness, there always will be obstacles and difficulties. And those obstacles are represented by the thorns of the rose. And, and um, you know, we have to journey um, through the, the trials, um, and there's no spiritual progress without those trials. So when we think of pain or waiting or separation or loss of a loved one, um, there's so many thorns that we encounter on, on the path and it's ne they're necessary um, for, for it to um, approach that state of grace. And um, you know, when we're seeking our own truth, we can advance and flourish on the mystical path despite the the trials of the long journey so so the thorns on the rose symbolize our difficulties and our challenges in this world and the things we need to endure and leave behind and um you know i really believe that if we're not tested with life's challenges it's not really possible for us to grow to really achieve spiritual realization it's almost though it's almost as though this is the way the world is designed, you know, to have those pinpricks, as my, my Guru Prabhupada calls them the pinpricks, you know, or the pricks of the thorn. So I believe that when we're pushed to the brink, we're pushed to become something new, something unprecedented that we've never seen in ourselves. And and I there's no other way to reach that that place. And I, I believe it's by design. So thorns are necessary. Um, in our travel from the here to the hereafter. And it's only by facing those thorns calmly and, and enduring their pricking with patience that their grace and faith um, can come about and that we can attain that mystic knowledge. I wanted to share one other thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard or read about a woman. She was a simple village woman in the state of Maharashtra in India. And her name um, is Sindhu Thai Saptal. 
and she's called the um, mother of the orphans. So her story is a very, very long one and a, a painful story. Um, she became a whistleblower in her village. She called out a man who was sexually abusing the women in the village. She was thrown out by her you know, a, a quite ignorant husband. Anyway, it's a long, long story. But she said something very deeply wise that um, she said, my path has been full of thorns. But I made friends with those thorns, and my path became blessed. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so, so beautiful. I love that from Sindhu Thai, such a dear um, mentor for us all. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, um, in herbal medicine, we use roses um, as a healer for sexual trauma, if that's one of its indications. Wow. And my teacher, Margie Flint, uh, one of my teachers who lives in... Um, in Massachusetts, she said that you use the white rose petals for children because it's a very gentle energy. And so you can just fill their bathtub with white rose petals if, if a child has experienced sexual or really any trauma. And that's very, very healing for them on a, on a subtle body level. Um, and as they get older into teenager, you could use like a light pink. And then for adults, we use red. <laughs> that's so interesting. So interesting. So the the different manifestations of the rose from from gentle to you know to the the passion that's needed for really the passion that's needed for the spiritual quest, right? right. The hero's journey, the heroine's journey. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you know, it, it it kind of one thing I when I think of the rose, whenever whenever I speak of rose or think of rose, I always think of this Neil Young Neil Young song. I don't know if you've heard it before, but it's um, "Love is a rose. You better not pick it. It only grows when it's on the vine. A handful of thorns, and you know you've missed it. You lose your love when you say the word mine. And um, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so poignant. So poignant. So I think when we approach the spiritual path, there's a continuum. I think of it as the continuum that we go from the, from the realm of I and mine. You know, the mine, this is me and this is mine and me, 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 mine, mine, mine. And then we gradually, gradually come to the place of Shanti, Shanti in the yoga practice, which is like the nirvana place. It's like the, the zero point, right? But then on the on the personalist paths, um, the Sufi path or the path of bhakti, then there's another side that goes past that shanti shanti. And that is the place where the lover, the devotee or the practitioner begins to think the beloved is mine, that nothing is mine. So if I pick that rose, um, that may it may wither, but the spiritual rose, the spiritual quest. The rose is meant to be offered to divinity, to the mm. beloved, right? Yeah. So that that beloved is mine, even though nothing else is mine. There's nothing else I can take with me at that at, in those last moments, but um, my love for that beloved person. Oh, thank you. That's so helpful because you know sometimes I wonder, you know, mine. We're 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 kind of taught, you know. Um, yeah, to, to love, but to not, you know, we want to possess, but we don't want to love. And, um, and in, in Bhakti, yeah, there's this, uh, we want to possess, we, you know, we, we want to possess in the spiritual, but we don't necessarily possessing in the material in terms yeah. of that kind of love, like Neil Young was pointing to, we lose, mm -hmm. you know, we, so we, we lose our love when we have, and we're left with a handful of thorns if we try mm -hmm. to grab at it in the material but and so true. And, you know, in bhakti, on the path of bhakti, it's not about detaching um, from all the things I love in this world, but it's about a positive, cultivating a positive attachment to that eternal beloved person. So and, and teaching those I love about that beloved. So, you know, you might think, oh, I'm not supposed to be attached to my kids, but show them the path to the beloved, show them how to offer a rose to the beloved, that the rose is to be offered to the most beautiful person, you know? So, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love this, yeah. <laughs> oh. and, and how about, um, you know, the charm of the rose? Uh, you know, I, I was, in Christianity, 
the rose was actually considered kind of a forbidden plant and it, you know, because it was considered to be a pagan, you know, a plant of the pagans and a plant of Venus, which was associated with lust. Um, but yet it's, it's, it, it, it seems to have charmed even the Christians. Um, how do you see the rose in Christianity? You know, how, how, what do you think happened to the hearts of people who at one time said no to the rose? Right. The rose was too beautiful and it couldn't be rejected. So, you know, in Christianity, um, during prayer and meditation, the fragrance of the rose has come to symbolize God's angels in the vicinity. Mm. And it's believed that roses have the most powerful energy and the highest vibration that's likened only to angels because angels operate at a higher vibration so they can easily connect with roses, which I think is really amazing. And um, yeah, the rose represents heavenly joy. And then of course, in the Song of Solomon in biblical literature, there's the, the Rose of Sharon. I'd like to find out more about the Rose of Sharon. I don't know more, but the Rose of Sharon is depicting the divine love between God and his people. And then, um, the recitation of the rosary, right? Oh, yes. Represents a garland of roses, the adoration of the Virgin Mary, because traditionally she's offered roses. And, you know, I wanted to say that here in Washington, D.C., we have this beautiful uh, shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And all the windows are these round um, stained glass windows, mandalas, really. And they're all roses because the, that cathedral is offered to Mary. So all the windows are in the, the images of roses. Um, um, yeah, to, to dedicated to Mary. So wow. the rose was too beautiful and couldn't be rejected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. And it's, I know, and it's, and it lives on. I mean, it's here in the world with us at birthdays, on Valentine's Day, at funerals. You know, the rose is such a part of, of our world still, um, we still can't resist it. It's, you know, some of the greatest perfumers. Um, there's a great book called The Emperor, the Emperor of Scent. Um, I forget who wrote it, Chandler or something, but it's all about the history of perfumery. And rose was like one of the most sought after oils because it's it takes so many roses just to get a drop of the fragrance. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I, I love how, how it still lives today. And, you know, one thing I, I often tell for when I'm working with my herbal clients and they're working on matters of the heart, I often say, go buy yourself some roses and just, you know, get some <laughs> bud vases and place one in your bathroom and one on your desk and one in your kitchen, just mm -hmm. spread them around your space because that just even seeing the rose can open up the heart. So beautiful. And, you know, rose water also symbolizes the, um, the colorless wine of the beloved that causes like a spiritual intoxication and its fragrance is supposed to give signs of the fragrance of the beloved and the, who is the source of love, right? Mm -hmm. and, and rose water is also um, a symbol of passing from this worldly realm into the heavenly realm. And then drinking rose water clears and purifies the body and as you're saying, helps ailments of the heart and helps access the soul. And it's a scent from this world to, to the eternal world. Mm. Yeah, I was walking around my house gathering all my rose paraphernalia and I grabbed some <laughs> of my rose water here. And, um, you know, it's a nice one. I'll use it with my girls, you know, just, it's a, it's a, also just a gentle nervous system relaxant. So sometimes I'll just spray it on them or before bed, I'll spray it on their pillow. Um, and it just really relaxes. Cause I feel like it puts us back in our heart, you know, it calms the mind, puts us back into the place where we can be most receptive. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, the way a rosebud gradually opens and blooms and gives its beauty and aroma in the same way the soul realizes herself on this path of loving devotion and the, the beauty of the real spiritual form um, becomes revealed and fully blossoms into fruition. Mm. So I think, you know, in bhakti, there's this metaphor of the 
Um, well, you know, I think in all spiritual paths, God is compared to the tree of life. And uh, Sri Radha, who we just had her appearance day last week, she's like the vine that wraps herself around that tree of life, that loving vine. And um, the bhaktas or the devotees, the people on the spiritual path are, are like the leaves and flowers of that creeper of that beautiful rose like vine and and then the you know the full-blown rose and the the fruits and flowers of that devotion are are you know the goals of um, the path of of bhakti you know i wanted to say something also that i think is um, beautiful the path of bhakti is about divine love and relationship and um, once my teacher Prabhupada, it was a, a sweet story someone brought him a, a beautiful rose, but without any leaves. And he said, where are the leaves? And, you know, we think, oh, well, the beautiful part is the rose, the flower. But it's so interesting when we think that beauty is in the relationship, um, the flower and the leaves or the jewel and the setting or, you know, so that the beauty of the relationship, um, this is the, you know, ultimate spiritual beauty of the, you know, coming to the beloved as, as a lover and the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest desires. Yeah. Wow. It's for him to notice that. And, you know, he was, I, from, from what I've heard, he's always just, his words were very precisely chosen. And so, yeah, I mean, how often do we just strip? <laughs> we think we just have to strip off those leaves and thorns and, um, but the, yeah, the beauty is in that relationship. That's so, that's such a beautiful image. Yeah. And then going back to that thought of Rumi, that the rarest essence, we don't think of the thorns having the essence of the rose, but he says the rarest essence of the rose is in the thorns. So when we come across those thorn pricks or those pin pricks in our lives, I think it's important to pause and to take a deep breath and to ponder, you know, why has this come to me? And what am I supposed to learn here? Mm. And then our path will be, will be blessed. Mm. When That's... we make friends with the thorns, as Sindhu Thay said, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, what a lovely conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, you know, the rose, the rose, I think, um, again, just such a beautiful way to open up this conversation about plants and spirituality because they just they're such symbols and and they're available to us you know they're there you can grow these symbols you can um, get them from your grocer or your uh, florist you know these are something that's we can have in our space to remind us of these of these greater teachings mm. yeah um uh, and, and to become ourselves like an invisible fragrance you know like a guide from the beyond that, you know, like to go through this world, like creating that, a fragrance of love, you know, in such a subtle way to up, uplift the world by, you know, even an invisible way, just like a, the in, invisible fragrance of a garden of roses. So beautiful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do we think we have time to share? Um, I have that Mary Oliver poem on Rose. Oh, I love it. We must. Could I read that? Okay. <laughs> Mary love... Oliver is always right on target. Isn't <laughs> she? Uh... she is just, yeah, such a beautiful conduit of, of these teachings. So this is a, a poem and then maybe you could close us with some closing thoughts. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is called Roses by Mary Oliver. Everyone now and again wonders about those questions that have no ready answers. First cause, God's existence. What happens when the curtain goes down and nothing stops it? Not kissing, not going to the mall, not the Super Bowl. Wild roses, I said to them one morning, do you have the answers? Mm -hmm. And if you do, would you tell me? The roses laughed softly. Forgive us, they said. But as you can see, we are just now entirely being, or we are just now entirely busy being roses. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful, so beautiful. So yeah, you know, I think uh, the rose is like a guru to us, right? 
-hmm. the rose is like a, a guide from from beyond um reminding us that we can also open gradually open our hearts that maybe our hearts are like a tightly closed bud right now and we don't want to let anyone in and we don't want to let any love in but little by little by um you know what the divine sunlight um the sweet rain the good good earth right mm -hmm. we can open our hearts to to love and and uh, go from this world to the next in in a mood of um, treading lightly on the earth but blessing the earth like an invisible fragrance of a rose mm. thank you so much Rukmini for your beautiful thoughts inspirations and and yeah just I think this is such a wonderful meditation to uh, to leave with so Thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who want to learn more about Rukmini, um, there'll be some links for Urban Davy, her Patreon community group, where she teaches on Wednesday nights, um, and also a way to stay in touch and hear more about um, her ongoing teachings and work in the community, especially really uplifting the voices of women on the spiritual path. So um, please look out for her, find her work, follow her as closely as I do, and you will not be disappointed. She, you, the roses will start blooming and you'll be like, whoa. <laughs> so, so thank you so much again. And we'll be back um, in a few weeks to explore another plant teacher. Thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you for opening this beautiful conversation. I think there's some beautiful divine electricity between us. So I'm so grateful to you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rukmini. And thank you everyone for watching. Please leave your comments. Um, please like this video. Please subscribe to all of our platforms so other people can find us. And if you have a friend who loves roses or you think might benefit from this talk, please forward it along to them. So thank you, everyone. Take care.